My guest this week is Chris Miller, CRO and co-founder of Flaunt.xyz. Chris started from humble beginnings in small town Indiana and was inspired by Mad Men and a best friend to move to New York. After seven years in media and partnerships, Chris and that best friend Connor started what would eventually become Flaunt.xyz, an enterprise loyalty management platform that serves as a single entry point into Web3 for brands and their customers. We get a behind the scenes look at the formation of Flaunt and the ever evolving pain points Flaunt solves for its customers using Web3 technology. Most of all, we hone in on the fact that Web3 is not a one and done. It is a long-term play and can create long-term value if executed correctly. LFG baby, let's start vibing. Zach French is a bar certified attorney and nothing expressed by Zach during Web3 with me shall be considered legal advice. All the opinions expressed by Zach and his guests are solely their own opinions. All content in Web3 with me is for informational purposes only. Zach and his podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed during Web3 with me. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Zach. I'm super, super pumped about this. Yeah, me too. I just I, I find so much excitement in every one of my guests because everybody's got something unique to share. Uh, the one thing they have in common is that they are active participants in Web3. And so I get to learn from, from each one of you. Um, I typically start these episodes by letting the audience get to know who you are, uh, what makes Chris Chris. So uh, feel free to start wherever you like. Yeah, so I'm originally from a small town in Indiana. And, you know, it's the kind of place that is not going to hear about Web3 until two years after it goes mainstream, like that, that small, like picture the movie Hoosiers. Yeah. Um, and I actually, of all places, I moved to New York City uh, after college to work in advertising. And that was for two reasons. And the first one was I was absolutely obsessed with the show Mad Men, thought that I was going to move to New York and become Don Draper, which obviously didn't happen. Um, <laughs> But the second reason is my longtime best friend was actually going to be moving to New York and uh, was doing an internship there that summer. And I, I ended up spending six years there, you know, met my wife there, got to do, um, you know, some really cool things working in a few different facets of the advertising industry. So I started at a creative agency, uh, then moved over into more like digital media strategy and then kind of rounded it out with some uh, programmatic and, and ad tech experience. But my career and really my adult life has been kind of defined by taking some some big leaps of faith. And my first was moving to New York, um, obviously coming from a really small town in Indiana. That's like people don't even consider that. Right. It's not an option. Right. Um, and then, you know, the, the next one happened a, a few years later where I was kind of going down a certain career path within my organization and then completely pivoted into a different type of role, moved to a new city, Chicago, where I am now. And then the third one that really sticks out is uh, December 2021. I'm sitting uh, at the back corner table in McSorley's in New York, uh, if anybody listening has ever been to McSorley's. And that same best friend that I followed to New York in the first place um, planted the idea in my head to start a company together. And of course, that best friend is uh, is Connor Kelly, who is my co-founder and the CEO at Flaunt. And the rest is really history. He had left Roblox um, a few months before that. And we just had, you know, really complementary skill sets in addition to a longtime friendship. So it, it just it made sense logically. And you know, looking back now, almost a year after starting the company, it's the craziest and also best uh, leap of faith that, that I've ever taken. Wow, that's super interesting. So it sounds like uh, the early career was spent navigating advertising. Um, what kind of, I guess, learnings, mental models, frameworks did you pick up during that time? Um, and then, you know, how did those kind of lead into, uh, if they did, into co-founding Flaunt? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest one is uh, it, it goes back to the idea of what what's the ROI on this program. And I think, you know, as a lot of brands have gotten their start in the Web3 space, I mean, we're, we're still talking to brands that when we ask brands, you know, a very simple question, what are the ROI levers that you're looking at as part of this program? You know, a lot of them are still in the really early stages. This is coming out of like an innovation budget. And 
Um, and they're still trying to figure that out. But for me, that was actually, you know, even a couple of years before that, uh, that fateful day at McSorley's when Connor was working at Roblox, that was what I was asking him about, you know, brands like Nike and Gucci are, are creating these new call it metaverse esque experiences on Roblox's platform. My curiosity was, you know, how are they measuring the ROI? Um, and, and ultimately like, what do those brands need to see in order to scale these, these types of programs? So I, I think that's the biggest thing, Zach was, um, really this, this importance that everything we do from a marketing standpoint needs to ladder up to what is the impact that it's actually having, um, on the business, both in the short term and long term, and, and how are we actually tangibly measuring that? That's interesting. So what kind of were your early observations as you were doing the market research for, for the business was there's obviously a, a lack of focus on it, but was it related to too much of a short term mindset or a long term mindset? What were the gaps that you were seeing specifically? Yeah, I mean, the ROI story for the lucky few brands who launched NFTs in the early days when it was still the cool thing to, you know, sell out your your collection and uh, i mean everybody i'm sure who's listening to this podcast has seen some of the stats around what nike and adidas and, and others have have made um so i i think that that was um one of my early observations but it, it quickly as that as the bear market came and as that trend sort of um fell in in everyone's wake it, it really became about, okay, if uh, we can't charge a thousand bucks per NFT for these things, um, how do we connect this to the core business, uh, gamify experiences and reward people with collectibles? So I, I think that's a lot more of what we're going to see. But yeah, I, early on, um, you know, everybody was enamored by the idea that, hey, I can sell 10,000 of these NFTs and make, you know, 20 million bucks overnight. Um, and, and some brands probably still could do that if they launched with that strategy. But I think the reception for that, um, you know, is, is not what it once was. So it sounds like if, if I could summarize the, there was a focus on ROI, it was a bit more short term or oriented, and there was almost no thought about how does this fit into our long term brand strategy? That's, that's exactly right. I mean, how many. Uh, even well-established brand projects, did you see where there was a, uh, you know, roadmap coming soon on the website, uh, even before they sold the NFTs, let alone after? Um, and that, I would say, is is more acceptable from a, uh, you know, a Web3 native brand or project that, you know, this is literally how they were going to fund the roadmap. Um, I think for for established brands, uh, especially now, critically important to, um, you know, leverage what they have at their disposal uh, uh, in the core business to really engage super fans and give people a reason to spend 150 bucks on your on your NFT. Um, so yeah, I, that was a perfect encapsulation and probably much more uh, eloquent than what came out of my mouth. I get to talk to a lot of people. <laughs> um, so I guess you, you have this fateful moment at McSorley's. Uh, I do not know what that is, but next time I go to New York, maybe I'll check it out. Um, Gotta check it out. The, um, was that your first exposure to Web3? Had you been exploring? Had you read white papers? Had you collected NFTs? Was there something else that was kind of in the back of your head so that you understood how the industry worked? Or was it business first mindset? This sounds like a great business to create. So the first idea uh, that we were kicking around for starting this company was how can we, you know, help brands, um, you know, measure the ROI on their on their Roblox act activations um, or, or, you know, kind of gaming platform activations uh, more broadly. And at that point, I, I knew what NFTs were, uh, obviously, had not actually like purchased an NFT hadn't really engaged, but it was right around that same time that another friend um, put the LinksDAO project on my radar. And so I ended up, I, you know, the, the LinksDAO 
mint day, I think was new year's day of 2022. And that was at, like, I had been following the space for a little bit, but that was the first NFT that I had actually bought. And so I'm like scrambling on the phone with my friend, like, how do I set up this MetaMask Chrome extension <laughs> and trying to figure out on New Year's Day? Um, so so that was my first like personal entry point into the space and, you know, joining their discord. And it's funny because that that professional inflection point is directly attributed to my personal inflection point and experience with with link style um, because what i really quickly came to understand was that there was something a little special here about this community of people who had truly shared shared ownership over this community in the form of um you know our nfts which functioned as our membership as our access pass to different things um, who had this common goal of, hey, how cool would it be if we actually kind of pulled together and um, bought a golf course or 10 now that, you know, now that they've actually gone ahead with their their first purchase, I think it was this week. Yep. Um, so, you know, light bulbs started going off for me and, and Connor had also, um, you know, participated in that mint as well. And so we really started kicking around the idea of, man this this sort of like community-based loyalty program we weren't calling it a loyalty program at the time but this community-based strategy there's something really interesting we personally feel a sense of loyalty and attachment to link style and we think there's something really powerful that other brands might be able to take advantage of and so that kind of led us in the direction um uh into you know creating this Web3 loyalty software business. I love that. I mean, I I'm, when I'm teaching Web3, when I'm explaining Web3 to people that don't understand it, I often use examples like LinkStyle trying to buy a golf course and now actually buying one, which is pretty awesome. I saw that news wow. last week in Scotland. Um, and then Krause House, uh, um, you know, trying to buy an NBA team, which eventually I think they'll get there. They're very close. I think they got outruled on one bid, but own a part of a team maybe in Europe at this point, like, and then yeah. the constitution DAO, which is like the most extreme example of like five days right. raising 40 something million and getting outbid by a hedge fund to, to buy a copy of the U S constitution. Um, <laughs> so it's just like, it's this cool, uh, never before possible ability to pool capital between people who have no really prior relationship other than having a digital wallet, maybe, and sharing some NFTs, um, being able to make an impact and buy things. Um, I think the, the naysayers will often say, well, what makes you equipped to do the thing at the end? And I think that because of the ability to communicate across platforms, that can be figured out. The point is not to raise the money and buy the thing the next day. In fact, sometimes it takes years like now right? Or more years. And, but that gives people the ability to step up into leadership roles. Hey, I understand how to, you know, do landscaping at golf courses. I'm just making this up. Um, you know, all these different things, how to do, right, drive membership, how to run a pro shop, how to do all these different things. Um, because there's so many people there, odds are, if they bought into this, someone knows a little bit about each one of those aspects. Um, are 100%. you, have you, yeah, and, and I think the other thing I've, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, have you actively participated in Link's DAO and like, like at like, uh, like fundamental level? Like, will you be involved in like management or anything like that, or is it just going to be more of a membership for you? Yeah, it, it'll be more of a membership for me. I, um, uh, I live in Chicago, as I mentioned, and they, uh, we have a few Five Iron locations here, and so they do League Night, which I've, I've gone to a few of those, um, which is great. I've, I've met some other people that are working. Uh, you know, at the intersection of brands and Web3 through literally like going to Five Iron on a Wednesday night and playing nine holes of virtual golf, um, which which is super fun. I've participated in, you know, almost all of the votes and don't tell my wife, but I have purchased probably like hundreds of dollars, uh, maybe verging on over a thousand dollars of their like merch and different things that they've rolled out, which is all really, really high quality. And so again, like they are a they are a brand in right. in the truest sense of the word and i think what separates the Lynx DAOs and the kraus houses and, and even the constitution DAO, despite the fact that they weren't successful in their ultimate goal was the fact that there was a clear purpose for bringing 
those folks together. And they all kind of had this inherent understanding. And I think one of the things we've seen some of the other established brands do well, I really admire what um, what Lacoste is doing. And, and it's because they've made it clear that like, hey, this isn't just this digital asset that you bought and we're just like throwing you all in a discord and like, good luck, figure it out. It's like, we're here to, as Lacoste puts it, co-create the future of the Lacoste brand. And that may take, you know, a few years. It may initially take on really kind of like micro decisions that only really impact this community, but they're laying a foundation and kind of building the muscle to actually co-create with their customers. And I think a lot of brands don't have that muscle today. And the idea of it kind of scares them off or community building scares them off. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's, there's ways to build that muscle without launching a full on, you know, like scaled across channel loyal uh, community based loyalty program. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan of link style. Um, I'll always have kind of a special place in my heart for it, given it was the first NFT that I, that I bought. And because the community has done just such a phenomenal job of really keeping people engaged and, and offering a lot of value. Yeah. Everybody has their, you know, inflection point into the space. They have the thing that really made them a believer in it to the point where they are actively participating. And especially on my show, I have businesses around it, right? Or somehow yeah. involved in, in a business that serves uh, Web3 in some way or serves Web2, Web3 in some way. Um, it's uh, if, For me, it was art. Uh, for a lot of people, it's the Bitcoin white paper, right? Um, I've had plenty of guests on the show that dismissed Bitcoin when it first happened, but then they read the white paper and all of a sudden, ah, oh, this makes a lot of sense. This isn't just maxis, although those are the loudest voices in the room. Um, <laughs> and it's it, it is, man. We each have our unique story, and I don't think I'll I'll ever stop stop buying art NFTs. Right? I enjoy it. They may not be worth anything ever, but I get to go look at all this art, and I get to support creators, and I'm cool with that. Um, that. Yeah, it's 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 a beautiful space, man. And that's the wide, vast array of it. That's why I, I mean, I've even considered changing the name of my show because I feel like Web3 is so limiting because it really is just a new backbone of the Internet. Right. It's a new way to connect people to build stronger ecosystems, which is 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 why I'm sticking around. I'm sure it's why you're sticking around. Um, I want to pivot a little bit, though, because you do have an amazing business that you've now started um, and you 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 were you are in a shared community with myself. Shout out to the jump community. Um, They're doing a great job of providing a much needed resource for marketers and marketing focused organizations and brand focused organizations around the Web3 space through their discord. Jeff Kaufman has done a great job of building that community. Um, one. What was your founding story into into Jump? But then, too, let's talk about Flan a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, my entry point into Jump, uh, I, I mentioned, you know, I worked in advertising prior to uh, starting Flaunt. And so a handful of folks actually from a few different companies um, were very active in Jump and they were posting about it on, on LinkedIn. And then I think... Um, probably a lot of people who joined around the same time uh, may have a somewhat similar um, kind of catalyst moment with Jump, which was they had a, a an email go out with Morning Brew, I think, that was like talking about, you know, what this community was all about. And this was when, you know, Connor and I were in the, um, in the early stages of, of, again, trying to like identify exactly our entry point as a, as a business. What problems were we going to solve? We knew that it was kind of helping brands figure out how to use NFTs for, for customer engagement. Um, and so we just, we saw this community and we were like, oh yeah, we should, we should totally check this out. And I think from the beginning, our big focus with jump was how can we actually add value? back into this community and not just try to extract value from it because there are so many amazing talented smart people that are in the community that it's really easy to just kind of sit there and like read what everybody posts and um and and not you know add value back in and so that was um uh, and and i i certainly credit connor for kind of taking the lead on that he was like leading some of the the weekly news hours and you know i've helped kind of um, assemble some of the, um, 
uh, local like Chicago meetups with some other folks uh, as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been an incredible community. We're um, super grateful for all the relationships that we've, I mean, sometimes it's funny. We'll literally look at our sales pipeline and say, yeah, that one's attributed to jump in some way, shape or form as well. So it's been, um, it's, it's been great for us. Um, on the, on the flaunt side of things, um, you know, I, when we first started, um, it was funny because when we finally kind of landed on the, Hey, this is a, a, a loyalty marketing, um, initiative. These are, uh, like we want to target loyalty marketers <laughs> and, um, we learned pretty early on. It didn't take us too long that playing the web three evangelism game wasn't going to pay the bills as a software business. <laughs> it's awesome for you, Zach. And it's certainly something that we still do. Well, um, I changed my branding. <laughs> I was an, a web three evangelist for a long time. And I'm like, dude, that's so intense. Like I'm just gonna be an educator. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I particularly remember going to um, a loyalty marketing conference last year <clears throat> and we were definitely the only web three related company there. And when we started telling people about what we were doing, they looked at us like we had three heads. <laughs> there were a couple of people who during different panels and so forth, kind of jokingly mentioned uh, in talking about what's next, like, oh, maybe we'll check out NFTs and everybody kind of chuckled under their breath, right? So, and that I'm talking like September last year uh, that that was the case. And then Starbucks Odyssey launched and all of a sudden we just, or, or it announced that it was going to be launching. And then all of a sudden there was just this tailwind of focus on both on the web three side, but also on the kind of web two side about, oh, this is something that we should pay attention to. And it is a loyalty marketing initiative, even if in a lot of organizations, as I mentioned earlier, it's starting out in their like, digital product or, uh, you know, strategy and innovation uh, orgs to get started. Um, so, you know, with some of those early learnings and again, a focus as a, as an early stage company on, um, Hey, we gotta, we gotta pay the bills. Uh, we gotta, um, you know, shorten the, the sales cycle. We ended up shifting our focus to serving brands who had an existing kind of web three imperative or some sort of initiative in motion. Um, but that had a clear problem that needed to be solved. And that's kind of aligned with our incremental product development and our continued refinement of our positioning over time is just, you know, what, what are the pain points that the people who actually have dipped their toe into this space have today and how can we solve for those? And that could be something as simple as token gating discount codes that they want to give to their community. Um, I, I like to use the kind of two extreme examples that we're working with two different brands, one of whom was was managing all that previously on a like really expensive custom developed website that their devs had done, which was not being kind of kept up and managed. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there are like really big brands out there that are managing these things in Google Sheets. And so what we created, like our first product that we rolled out was very simple. Um, you know, it was a, a white labeled token gated uh, benefits portal to be able to surface different benefits, whether that's discounts, experiences, custom links, whatever, whatever it might be, just so that these people managing these NFT programs can get the benefits that they promised on their roadmap to their community in a really seamless and on brand way. You know, it takes on the look and feel of the brand site. It lives on their subdomain and, and so forth. Um, so that was like the first problem space that we really focused on solving. And from there, we've kind of evolved that to helping some of those brands look at how they scale their web three programs and make some of these things uh, more accessible. So, a lot of brands are like, hey, I launched a 10,000 uh, PFP collection. I really have no interest in launching any more NFTs soon. Well, they are really confined today to the Web3 natives who are, you know, mighty, but limited in, in size and scale. And there's so many brands that have these really rabid fan bases and, and audiences that just aren't going to go through the hoops 
required to get a MetaMask and fund it with ETH and, and buy the NFT. And so, um, you know, we're really focused uh, on helping brands who have launched existing programs now kind of scale those and make those more accessible and intuitive to their Web2 fans, um, as well as, you know, working with some brands and, and um, uh, I won't mention the specific brand yet, but we just signed a partnership with a, a fast casual restaurant um, where we're going to be kind of helping them launch their uh, uh, Web3 loyalty program from scratch. So actually, um, you know, doing the like smart contract development, the, the minting, um, and then enabling their Web3 and Web2 audience to participate in this, again, without having to jump through those hoops. So offering an, an email based uh, wallet for them that lives completely behind the scenes, and then uh, credit card payment option, for for instance, that we power through Stripe. So, um, you know, we really, our thesis is that um, the future of loyalty programs kind of is this fusion of social media marketing and, and what the original like Facebook pages were supposed to be back in the day, that community center. Traditional loyalty programs with gamification, where you are basically playing, you know, a, a game with the brand um, and unlocking rewards, um, and then, you know, like I said, kind of this this idea of uh, co-creation and and building community. And so everybody's watching Starbucks right now. What I love about them is they're experimenting with multiple use cases for NFTs. But um, the future of of loyalty programs is literally being written right now as we speak by um, the brave early brands and and companies like flaunt that are helping support their their visions for that that's awesome so i it, so you started off and you had a very very unique insight which is we may not be able to convince people to enter web3 so let's go to the people that are already here and maybe it hasn't reached its full potential let's let's help them reach their full potential what were the kinds of things i mean I, the first thing that came to mind is actually kind of ridiculous but um <laughs> of like buying back the pfps and like like trying to find a new way to distribute them to people that maybe weren't on board at the first time but like yeah what kind of specific strategies are you bringing to the these brands that allow them to kind of rethink or relaunch in a way their web3 initiatives yeah well the the first one that i um that I mentioned a, a minute ago was really just the idea that like enabling and administering benefits that have been promised to people is actually more complex than meets the eye when you have to be blockchain aware. And so that, that was kind of like our first problem space is like making these digital assets actually useful. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, uh, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the idea of being able to expand this fixed set of assets to uh, a broader customer base and there's a few ways that that we can enable that the most tangible um uh that that we're that we're building and, and enabling is a you know a marketplace a secondary marketplace that is simply a a, a branded you know ui that lives on the brand site but in the back end taps into the liquidity of OpenSea and Rarible and Blur and the other marketplaces where the Web3 natives mm -hmm. are listing their assets, but then enabling that Web2 user to come to web3.brand.com and actually start participating in this program, make the benefits really, really um, front and center. One of the other big you know, challenges that brands have right now is, is just the simple communication and reminders about, hey, these are the these are the benefits that you can access by participating in, in this program. And, um, you know, our ability to enable all of that to kind of happen in one place versus kicking people all over the internet uh, has really, um, you know, been successful for us to date. So, yeah, I, I mean, th those are some of the initial problem spaces that we're, we're helping solve for brands is really just trying to make this magic that we experienced with LinksDAO and some of the other communities that we were a part of um, accessible to more people without the prerequisites that have existed to date in Web3. 
So I guess, yeah, the community, that brings up a really good point around communication because, you know, one of the problems that plagues this industry in many different facets, you know, there's communication side, but there's also legal matters, right? Consumer protection matters is that when you transact on the blockchain, it's with a wallet address, right? And they haven't always KYC'd and they haven't always collected an email address and, th and they don't have to, right? If you want access to OpenSea, like all you need is a wallet address. So yeah. are you actually helping them learn how to contact certain wallet addresses like like manually? Um, like what, what does that look like? Yeah, it's a really good question. We're not necessarily, at least at this point, focused on like wallet to wallet communication. What we are helping brands with is collecting some of that critical first party data uh, as a gating mechanism to getting more out of the experience. Right. And that's that's not uh, just a Web3 problem. Like that's that's kind of a Web2 loyalty uh, program problem as well that like I need to be able to communicate with this person. Um, I need to be able to, you know, send an email to them when there's this new challenge that they can go and, and partake in. And so our focus has uh, uh, mostly been on how can we help brands provide compelling reasons for people to share some of that data and coming from the digital advertising world, you know, I would say that that was like a big part of my excitement about Web3 was this idea of kind of like shifting ownership back into the hands of, of everyday people. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also a balance. And I think that brands can can, again, provide really compelling reasons, i.e. benefits um, or exper exclusive experiences that are gated behind hey, we need your email because we need to be able to communicate with you uh, and so forth. So having come from that digital advertising background and also having participated in in the web3 space i feel like i i kind of see both both sides of the coin and we're um we're really trying to help enable a rich experience for the consumer and something that's never been possible in loyalty programs before which is loan owning your actual loyalty assets but then also helping the the brands um, not only collect that data but integrate on the back end with their salesforce marketing cloud or whatever crm they might be using to be able to you know trigger more personalized messages and, and so forth yeah i love that i think there's there's two things i want to unpack there i love I, and, and one of the com most common subjects we discuss on the show is the combination and power of seeing someone's wallet data along with any personal information you may have about the person and the fact that the the former actually might be weighted more because it shows an intent to buy something mm -hmm. um so yeah let's unpack that first and then i've got an, another uh interesting uh question for you yeah i think uh in the cookie-less world the visibility into uh your customer and that sort of golden record of the customer that lives in a lot of brands cdps where they are you know able to see hey this person has engaged with us on on social they've you know spent this amount with us over this amount of time um there are still some some limitations to what brands have visibility into and it and it it's okay, but it's mostly what are they doing in the in the confines of my program or engaging with my brand. And I think what gets really interesting uh, is the ability to have great as a brand, the ability to have greater visibility into um, a person's really like behaviors and the things they like through the other NFTs that they own and and you know what is in their wallet. But then on the flip side, giving the owner of that wallet more agency as to what they want to share. And I don't know that we're quite there yet. I think right now it's kind of just like open kimono for everybody to look what's in your wallet. I'm really excited to see how consumers start to have more ownership and agency over what is actually made visible to brands that there, there's a lot of really great um tools out there kind of in the web3 crm realm that are focused on extracting some of those additional insights and enriching your customer data based on 
not only what somebody's doing with your brand, but what else is in their wallet? What other projects and, and communities are they a part of? Um, and that kind of helps build out again in the in the background of a, a impending cookie list world. Um, brands are always looking for more insights about who their customers are and the, and their preferences and the things they like. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You, you just get a clearer picture, right? Not only is the, the single action of buying your NFT a clearer picture of you, who someone is, but the, the action of buying anything in their wallet, right, is kind of shows yeah. you more about that. And as more brands launch these projects, you're going to get an idea for the person who likes Starbucks and Nike might also like Lacoste, right? Like you're going to have uh, a lot of, of data availability. I, that will be interesting if they start to start to adopt uh, some sort of plugins into wallets that start to gate access. Uh, but there's always Etherscan and there's always somebody who's going to be able to do blockchain forensics in a way that that allows you to see that stuff, I think, uh, unless there is new blockchains, right, that are um, that are created. So um, that gets out of my technical realm. Yeah, so me too. I'll, I'll shut up there. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Totally fair. We're not going to start talking about tornado cash here, folks. Um, <laughs> but anyways, um, the other question I have for you is more on the kind of practical side of this. I think uh, and I fell victim to this. Uh, a lot of people just think NFTs, brand, marketing, it's all a marketing thing. Uh, and, you know, maybe some advertising, right? Um, well, that's to me what I'm starting to learn, just the tip of the iceberg. When brands are adopting these strategies, this is long term. They're trying to recreate the way that they engage their fan base or their customer base. So what are the other teams that you have to get buy-in from? What are the other teams involved in making these decisions? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, when we first started out, we were talking to loyalty agencies. We were going after loyalty marketers at brands. And I think they, they just weren't quite there yet. But what I think uh, is going to get really interesting is as these web three ideas and programs, or, or even if they're like campaigns to start that are more ephemeral, are being born out of the strategy and, and innovation teams, in order for those to get larger organizational buy-in and support, they need to be adding value into and integrating with the traditional loyalty program. So I, my belief is, and, and what we've experienced is that the strategy and innovation leads are ultimately looping in the uh, the loyalty folks to sign off if there is a like, you know, in the short term, some sort of integration point, uh, uh, even if it's just as simple as like the login. But then we're talking about, you know, OK, like how can this program, which is a standalone uh, supplement or complement to the traditional loyalty program, how can it actually help the loyalty team accomplish some of their objectives this year, which are, you know, greater take up rates for their loyalty program? What I what I absolutely love about what Starbucks is doing is that you had to be a Starbucks rewards member in order to participate in Odyssey. And I just thought that was genius because, I mean, probably just about everybody at this point is it has the Starbucks rewards app on their phone. Um, but I would have to imagine that they um, acquired some new loyalty program member, core loyalty program members as a result of launching Odyssey. And so I think it's it's kind of the, the blend and the dance of those two functions working together. Um, you know, as metaverse starts getting woven in and, and you know, virtual world creation, then it, it you know, you start uh, having conversations with like 3D product teams and so forth. You know, a lot of the bigger brands have have those um, uh, uh, teams within their their organization. So right now we're really seeing that it starts in the uh, in the strategy and innovation in or, or digital innovation. In some cases, a Web3 specific team, but that the brand team, the loyalty team, uh, and and some other you know really critical pieces within the organization are getting looped in and are um, you know really required to like sign off before um, you know these programs get signed off. Yeah, so it's going cross organization, right? Um, I imagine at some point legal teams will get involved too, 
right? Oh, yeah. um, I mean, there is IP that is related to a lot of these NFT projects. Some of them are custom artworks um, <clears throat> that have the brand name in them and what rights are being conveyed uh, when you when you are distributing these NFTs, when they're being traded. How do you get those rights to transfer from one owner to the other? Um, I think the original uh, goal uh, or original strategy with a lot of PFPs was, we'll put terms on our website. When people mint, they agree to the terms, but what happens after mint? That's the real question. Oh, yeah. Um, I know there what I met some people at NFT NYC last year that were trying to tackle the on chain terms of use. Um, but I don't know. Have you have you encountered any anybody trying to tackle that right now? Or are they just making sure that it's functional at this point? <laughs> not not uh, not to that extent. No, um, but I suspect we will. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So um, so what are some of the most unanticipated big problems that you are encountering as you're talking to all your current customers and new customers? Yeah, uh, it's a really great question. Um, I think what I would say the biggest one is, is just the silo of web three knowledge within the average enterprise organization. And I think we have to we have to do two jobs. We have to ensure that the the Web three team, um, uh, you know, understands in their kind of native tongue how this is solving their objectives, and then we have to speak more plain language around you know what what is the what is the ROI? What is the you know the, the practical application and use case of this technology with without any of the web three jargon. So I, you know, I, I think, I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but I think that's probably one of the biggest things is just having to wear a couple of different hats, sometimes even on the same call uh, to be able to, you know, speak natively to the web three folks and, and also, um, you know, speak in more web two terms to to the rest of the folks as well i mean it kind of begets a the bigger problem here which is that you know whenever you're talking about this space to anyone you, there's a a certain level of education that you have to provide as a preface right and there will be people that naturally got swept up into web three through various ways like me and you that will have general knowledge about it and really believe in it but on top of the fact that you have to sell the business on this is a good strategy, it's like, well, wait, WTF is Web3 anyways. Like, what is what is a, a an NFT, a non-fungible yeah. token? Like, I didn't know what fungible was before <laughs> I started doing this. Like, oh, I get it now. Interchangeable. Okay, cool, right? Like, there's a lot of jargon that you have to learn to get a base level of knowledge in this area. And as someone who's supporting marketing organizations, honestly, it's probably a good thing that you have to educate them internally because guess what? The general public's going to have just as is uh, just the same questions, right? They're gonna they're gonna say. Uh, you're telling me a meta meta what a meta mask like what are you talking yeah. about are you talking about facebook like you know like so there's there's just like i guess it's like almost good practice to be able to go in to the different teams and be able to change the words you're using to explain what the end goal is which is basically just to increase customer engagement retention new customer acquisition like all those goals are the same right yep and guess yep. what people have been gamifying this shit forever right this just gives you a whole new level of being able to gamify it and adding rarity and scarcity and like all these new interactive components of it. Totally. And two other like really tangible things that came to me while you were saying that are one, this idea, pe people understand that NFTs can function as a, as a ticket, a membership, a key to unlock X, Y, Z. You start to really cross wires for people when you start talking about tradability as like the one of the things that actually makes this novel. Uh, otherwise, why even do it in the first place? And so you'll you'll hear a lot of questions about, well, can we make it so they're not tradable? And it's like, 
Yes, but that you're kind of just defeating the purpose. Like, why why not just do a Web two membership? Yeah. Um, so that's number one, and number two is community building. And I mentioned this earlier, but for most brands, even if they have a fan base, community building is just not a muscle that they really have today. And so, you know, one of my bold predictions is that hey, if if any of this actually takes off, as I believe it will and that you know this new style of loyalty program um is is adopted in in earnest there is a multiplayer component to it there is a community oriented component to loyalty programs and that hasn't existed before and so it's not just like web3 terms and terminology but it's like building muscle and also helping brands see the value in what it actually takes to build a successful community. You can say on the surface, yeah, I want to build community. Sure, that sounds great. But in reality, it's really hard. It takes talented, dedicated, focused people to manage a discord, let alone in other sort of grassroots ways that you might want to um, you know, in, engage your uh, customer base and, and your super fans. So um, I think those are two other ones that come to mind are just like the, we start crossing wires sometimes when we talk about making these things tradable and, um, and building community and why that's so core to the ethos of what Web3 is really all about. Yeah, I mean, the financialization aspect is what onboarded most people. Yeah. <laughs> right, like I, I love the art, but the fact that I could trade it for more money than I bought it obviously kept me around, uh, you know, and by and putting a lot more money into it. Um, yeah. the, the interesting thing about the community aspect, which is, you know, all the rage, right? Like, oh, you've got a community you can build, is that for some reason, and I'm sure there are obvious reasons, there are, there's the ability for the community to be directly communicated with like never before, right? Mm -hmm. There, by virtue of buying an NFT, you feel like you almost like the next step in someone's head is like, is there a Discord? Is there, you know, a Twitter spaces that you guys are going to host? Is there like before it was kind of like, I'm going to launch a so-and-so ad on so-and-so platform and I can prove that I got these kind of eyeballs from these demographics from this area. Now it's like, hey, these people have direct access, right? And so how do I foster this direct access community to make my whole brand stronger? And that, and by the way, that's a double-edged sword, right? Oh, yeah. As a, as a, as you're seeing with certain uh, brands, whether they're Web three native or Web two, some people are shutting down discords because yeah. they can't handle the voluminous amount of conversation and direct access that you get when you put someone high level at a company inside there and make them accessible. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I have a, <laughs> I have a few examples uh, where. A CEO of a company has quite literally told us, like, I'm getting abused in the Discord. <laughs> it happens. And it's like they've never had to deal with that before. They're they're not the uh, the person interacting in the in the chat bot for customer service on their website, you know. So um, yeah, D Discord is another really hot topic that we'll probably run out of time to to dig in on today. Uh, I'll just say that I think you know at Flaunt our thesis is getting people to show up and hang out and participate in places where they aren't where they aren't already spending their time is damn near impossible and so our view is that if community building is a key pillar of your innovation of your loyalty strategy and web3 is involved in that or, or whether it is or isn't that you need to do it in a kind of omni-channel way. You need to do it in a grassroots way and engage people where they already are and want to hang out. And whether that's like private Instagram channels where you interact with people or, or Twitter or wherever, you know, on social or offline that they, that they would want to interact and engage with you um, versus trying to throw all of your Web2 audience into Discord and saying, good luck. <laughs> I love that approach. I mean, that's one of the biggest problems that I've identified over and over with many different guests and many off air conversations is like, 
Web3 thinks that everybody's going to join a Discord. Web3 thinks everybody follows crypto Twitter. Web3 thinks everybody knows what an airdrop is and has a MetaMask. Well, guess what? They don't, right? In fact, 99% of the world will never, ever do a lot of those things. And the big problem that comes from that is like, you aren't meeting people where they are, just like you said, right? Like people already have a lifestyle. It's just like when you're selling into B2B. Yeah, it'd be really nice for me to have the greatest insights in the world and to launch your product into my world and get all this feedback. But I already have a marketing automation tool. I already have a CRM. I already have all this stuff that I'm living inside of and catering to my audience. How can you integrate it into that so that it becomes a button and not a whole nother solution that I have to do? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Great analogy. Yeah. Oh, it's for, it comes from a few years of B2B sales. Um, <laughs> but uh, listen, we're, we're rounding the top of the hour. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I do have my two traditional closing questions. The first one is, how do you describe Web3? Yeah, I, um, I'm i not the guy who writes Webster's definitions on, Good. on words. But uh, I was at an event a couple weeks ago, and I think it was Brian Trunzo from Polygon um, classified Web3 as the convergence of the digital and physical world. And I thought that was just better than anything that I had, you know, spit out of my mouth previously. And I think what's really cool about that definition in particular is that, um, you know, that incorporates a lot of different technologies. Um, AR, VR, AI, and to me, the blockchain's role in all of that is really just the ownership layer. So people owning their data and having more control over that, as we talked about earlier, their digital assets, um, you know, owning digital assets in the same way that you own physical assets and being able to port them around to different places and experiences. So that interoperability um, concept is, is really powerful in the context of, of a Web3 world. But yeah, I think that's that's kind of my working definition uh, of Web3 is the, the convergence of the digital and physical world that's enabled by a bunch of different types of technology. I like that. I've, I've been also broadening my definition because I feel like it's, you know, blockchain is, may have been what gave rise to the term Web3, um, but it's really just the third iteration of, of the internet. So like, what does that mean? Uh, and that is, you know, more and more of our lives are spent digitally. So we're going to have to figure out a way to integrate those or else you're just going to get that one, two sides of the coin. One, it just doesn't work. Two, you're going to need a dystopian society ready, ready player one style for it to reach its fullest potential. And I don't think we want either one of those. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I love that. I love that. So my final closing question is uh, forward looking. It's uh, where do you see yourself in the space in the next six to 12 months? And where do you see yourself in the space in the next five to 10 years? Feel free to have fun with the five to 10 years. I'm not looking to go make <laughs> nets on what you're doing. I just like yeah. the question for speculative purposes. Yeah. Oh, man, it's such a good question, but it's also such a hard question. Um, look, I'm really optimistic that 2024 is a huge year for what I'll call Web3 loyalty programs. I think, you know, in every, in most consumer brands, the, uh, you know, Web3 has kind of crept into the conversation. I think people are spending this year, most, most brands are spending this year getting educated, starting to lay out a blueprint of what is our, what is our way in. And I also think that by 2024, you've got, um, you know, enough time has transpired on Nike's dot swoosh enough time has transpired with Lacoste, enough time has transpired with Starbucks that people have seen there's these different blueprints. It's Web3 isn't this one ubiquitous thing and there's not one way to go about it. And you can do something that's authentic to your brand, um, but also kind of proven through other innovators. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of really great and well-funded companies that are kind of chasing this opportunity and, and this space. And I think we all share a responsibility to lead brands through some uncharted waters. So that's like the short-term answer. Five to 10 years out, I, I think the only way that I could really approach answering that question is what are the time-tested truths? You know, consumer brands are going to follow each other's lead. And if in 2024 and beyond, this proves to be a viable new way to engage customers and drive ROI, then I have no doubt 
that every consumer brand will have woven Web3 tech into their marketing strategy in some way. And that, you know, in five to 10 years time, we're probably not using the term Web3. I hope we're not. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that where we are in five to 10 years has a lot to do with what happens in the next six to 12 months. So it's a really, um, it's, it's a really interesting time to be kind of doing that thought experiment. Yeah. I think, uh, one of my friends put it very eloquently. If web three succeeds, it'll just be called web, <laughs> you know, or internet. Right. Um, that's when, that's when you've seen the full potential is because it's been completely abstracted away. It's just how things are done now. And I hope that that is what happens. And I hope that it enables completely novel in real life, physical experiences by molding digital into that. Um, yep. I think that's an ideal world, not where it takes away from us touching grass, but from where it makes touching grass more fun, makes touching grass more engaging um, and, and encourages it, right? Encourages the things that actually make you happier. That can be done in a digital fashion and transferred into the physical world. Right. I point this way because my door's right there and I'm going to go outside right after this and I'm going to go touch some grass. You know, this has been great, man. I've really enjoyed this. Chris, do you have any closing so thoughts fun, you want to uh, to leave us with? No, uh, I really, really appreciate you having me on. I knew this was going to be a really fun conversation because our first conversation was a lot of fun. So thank you so much for, for having me on. Um, if there's anybody out there who's who's interested in, in connecting and um, learning more about what we're what we're building at Flaunt and kind of this you know Web three loyalty um, journey that that we're on. Um, feel free to connect with me on uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter. I think my Twitter is at Chris underscore Miller underscore thirty one. I may have just botched that. Um, we'll put it. Then, we'll put it in know, the final cut. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, and then uh, yeah. LinkedIn, obviously, as well. You can probably find me most easily through Flaunt. There's a few Chris Millers out there, so you may not get it on the first search. <laughs> I love that. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. Listen, uh, if you are listening to this and you are a consumer brand um, and you're like, wait a second, I've got a loyalty program. What is this Web3 thing? Reach out to Chris. He'll probably be able to help you out and let you imagine what it could be um, just with a little bit of augmentation from, from Web3. So cool. Thanks, man. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to Web3 with me. If you enjoyed the show and want to help us grow, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you want to connect with me personally, you can find me on Twitter at Zach underscore French underscore.